Hello everyone, and I hope you had a restoring and productive break. Before we start the mega technology showcase with live demonstrations of several different IT products, I just wanted to remind you uh, to share what you're hearing here in the outside world on social media using the hashtag 2021TEF. Now, over the next two hours, we're going to find out about useful, easy to duplicate SDL Studio apps, terminology integration into a cat tool, and finally, a glimpse of the newest tools and products on the automation scene. There's going to be live demonstrations of each tool, followed by some time for your questions about it. So please send them in as they occur to you. Don't wait till them till the end. We'll be having the question time after each presentation. And of course, you can send in your questions via the usual questions polls tab on the right hand side of your session screen. We're going to start with a presentation of useful transla translation related apps made by DG Translation and Studio add-ons in translation environments. We're going to be seeing tools that pick up on things like errors and inconsistencies in a presentation by Grigorz Okionevsky. I knew I was going to have problems with that name, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and he's from the European Commission's DG Translation. And uh, hello, please say hello. Hello. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, happy to be here. And I'm now going to hand over to you and your demonstration. Thank you. So uh, now it's the technical part. Uh, um, I mean, could you confirm that you can see my screen? Because, uh, yes, I can okay. see it perfectly. Great. Okay, well then uh, let's start. Uh, welcome. Um, I'm going to talk about the quality assurance tool in DG translation in the European Commission. And the tools help translators detect common errors, keep the terminology consistent and uh, type repetitive strings. Their main purpose is to decrease the cognitive load uh, for the translators while increasing the efficiency and quality. Let me say a few things about uh, the cognitive load. Let's have a look at this quotation. I'll give you a few seconds to read it. When you read this sentence, uh, it's clear that our human mind must be quite overwhelmed by the modern translation environment. Therefore, the focus of the quality assurance tools is to decrease the cognitive load by offering technological aids to reduce the information sources. And as for the information sources, here you have some possible candidates. The list, is, the list is created uh, with the legal translation in the Commission in mind. It is not my purpose to go through all of these sources one by one, but simply to show to you that uh, they, they, they are plenty. Uh, during the translation, the sheer number of sources is not the only problem the translator faces. The translator is also confronted with the conflicting information. For example, machine translation can give a linguistically acceptable but different translation of quotations from public acts. Uh, in addition, these quotations may be short and difficult to spot due to missing typography. Another example is terminology. Terms in IATA can be conflicting with the terminology in related legal acts. Further, style guides and formal requirements create an additional burden for the translators. There are lots of general rules, and these general rules are sometimes overridden by specific rules. For example, short date. Let's take the short date in source text. It's uh, provided to us in different formats. Here you can see some examples of these formats. For Polish, the short date should always be like this. But alas, the translator needs to remember a specific rule here because in the references to the official journal, the short date needs to be like this. All these information sources increase the cognitive load. Of course, technology can't solve all the problems mentioned here, 
but at least uh, we can take away some of the cognitive burden the translators are facing in their jobs. To this end, we try to address common mistakes which are difficult to spot by humans. These mistakes are mostly about accuracy, style or terminology. And let's have a look at the tools we use to deal with these, uh, with the accuracy and style. Imagine that you are a Polish translator today. You have finished your translation and now you want to control if it contains some mistakes. To this end, you need to press the button F8, which in Trader Studio triggers the verification action consisting of different verification providers. The result of this action appears in this window. As you can see, the action has produced five warnings. One of them comes from the Ruby checker, which is one of the providers for the verification. All the others come from the QA checker. Let's um, have a look at the different mistakes. Let's start with the Ruby checker mistake. If I click on the message, the program will take me to um, the given segment and I can hover my mouse over the message and I will see that there are actually two messages for this segment and one of them is, comes from the Ruby checker. In Ori I have 30, in Tra I have 20. So it's probably this one. So I'm going to change it and confirm the segment. The triangle stays because I still have a mistake coming from the QA checker. And the mistake says 110 wrong formatting of an OJ reference. Start typing the OJ reference. The problem is here. I'm not going to study it. I'm simply going to delete uh, the reference here and start typing. And another tool proposes the rest of the string and the tool that does that is an auto suggest, a third party plugin we are using to this end. So I'm accepting this and now I will confirm the segment and you will see that this warning will disappear. I'm confirming it, there's no warning. I still have three warnings, so let me go to one of them. And um, it says Ori segment contains a tabulator a big bigger why tra does not uh, well this here so I will correct it and confirm the segment let's go to this mistake here which is about a sequence of numbers which have been swapped and uh, the problematic sequence of numbers Unfortunately, there's no highlighting here, but the problematic sequence of numbers is here, I can see. Okay. And now you understand why it's so important to, to have these checks, because even if I know that there is a problem, it's difficult for me to <laughs> spot it in the segment. Then I simply copy the number and this solves the problem. I take the last problem, which is, um, what is it? Our segment contains a line break. And here it is. But this is actually a false positive because I do not want this line break here. All right, here you have the two verification providers you have seen during this presentation. The QA checker, uh, the regular expressions uh, module in it, which is a built-in functionality Travis Studio enriched by DGT, and the Ruby Checker, which is an internal development, a plugin. You have also seen the AutoSuggest, which is a third-party plugin. Let me explain a few things about these developments. 
The QA checker is a set of rules containing one or two regular expressions combined by a condition. Here you have the condition, here you have the regular expressions. In our set of rules, um, the rules are numbered and uh, the text you can see here uh, is what is displayed to the user when a given rule is triggered. In the commission, we have developed uh, rule sets from English to all official languages. We have a common set of rules developed centrally and language specific rules developed decentrally. For example, currently in the Polish English Polish set, we have around 350 rules. We have also rules from French to some official languages. And here you have some examples of what the QA checker, um, the regular expressions there, what they detect. They detect Roman numerals, subpoint letters, months, OJ references, institution names, legal act names, common mistakes, um, also legal act references, and several other content mistakes. And this is only um, a list of examples there. Are many more. Um, another development is the Ruby checker. It works from English and French to all official languages, and it works with numbers and tags. So text, the text errors there. Um, it is also language pair specific. And you might ask why have we developed an in-house number checker? Uh, this is because we find um, we found the, the built-in checks in in, uh, in studio too noisy and thus too inefficient. And numbers are language per specific too. And here you have an example for Steigeit specific situation. The leading zeros missing in the translation should not trigger any warning. This is just an example. Last but not least, you have also seen the auto-suggest. It works from English originals, but uh, it is not adapted to all official, official languages yet. Its function is to help translators adhere to the stylistic rules. Let's see a short presentation of this tool. Here you have some examples of strings dealt with by the plugin. The first 11 segments are all references to the same official journal. As you can see, they all differ, which occurs now as texts. The remaining segments um, are some other examples of strings dealt with uh, by the plugin. Let me move to the first segment. Place my cursor here now, and I get a hit from my translation memory. And the hit is unfortunately wrong. It gives me a wrong number here. So I delete it and I start typing and I get the correct string. I move, confirm the segment, move to the next one. And again, I get a wrong hit from the translation memory, even with the wrong page here. I delete it start typing and again I get the correct string. Now the thing is I do not need this 10 here. This is why it's left out. I move to the next one, start typing and get the correct string. Now I've moved through all the segments and as you can see the strings are identical here even though they are very different here. Let's go to the next segment. Start typing and get the result. Start typing here and get the result. Just have a look here. It's another case than here because this hit reacts to the by regulation and this hit reacts to the regulation alone. And we have things like that. And here I will get two hits because it might be a date, it might not. 
here it is a date, so I will accept it. But this here is most definitely not a date range. I am entering the last hit here, which consists of two different chunks. And uh, this is the end of the presentation. This is how it works. All right. Um, let's go over to uh, to the terminology verification, which is uh, another subject uh, for today. Uh, on one of the previous slides, you might have noticed that Toronto Studio has a terminology ver verification module. It's called uh, the terminology verifier. However, we have decided to move the terminology verification to the QA checker, or more precisely to the regular expressions module uh, there. As you know, we use it for other purposes as well. Uh, we do, um, we do, we, we have decided that, um, and we, uh, we do the movement using a special tool that converts term to regular, to regular expressions and exports them to a QA checker profile. We have chosen this approach because the terminology verifier in Studio does not perform sufficiently well for us. Uh, like in this example, where we have an English-Polish text of 603 segments with 58 terms uh, defined in the text itself, and the terminology verifier uh, throws 22 error messages, of which only one is justified, and the regexes in the QA checker throw one message uh, and this message is justified. So let's see how, how this tool works in praxis. Let's imagine you are a French translator now. You have finished your translation and want to check it. Your translation contains some terms. They are, for example, here. There are, in fact, over 50 such terms in this text, and you have added them all to your term base. Now you want to check them using the QA checker, and this requires some conversions, and I will not show them in this video. I will only show um, the final result. So I'm pressing the F8 now to trigger the verification. The results of the verification are here. There are altogether nine messages about terminology. You can see them all here. Let's have a look at them. Here's the message. Let's see what it says. Okay, I see. I need to add the word mode here. I add it, confirm, and the message disappears. Let's go to this problem here. Well, we should have it. And here we probably have the same. Yes, we do. And so on and so on. I will not torment you with the rest, but they are all justified. Now I have switched to the terminology verifier that built in and run against the same term list and get 38 messages. So 29 more and none of these 29 is justified. This is why the QA checker solution is preferable in spite of um, the conversions that are needed. Yeah, well, they are needed, not shown yet, but I will show them. So uh, now you, you have seen how it works. Um, let me uh, give you a few more pieces of information about the process. The terminology verification needs to be run on relevant terminology. Otherwise, you risk noise. You don't want that. Uh, this is why we collect the relevant terminology during translation into one term base. When the translation is finished, we run two conversions. 
uh, import the results into the QA checker and uh, run the verification. Let me show you how the conversion of terms of two regulators works. Um, what you're going to see is a backstage process using the tool we are using. It's an Excel-based tool. Um, our translators usually don't see it. Uh, instead, they use a one-button solution, which uh, I will present later. And just to show you the Excel sheet we use for the conversion of terminology to QA checker rules, here it is. You have the term list used for the project you saw. And if I click on this button here, I will convert this term list to QA checker rules. I'm doing it now. And here's the result. Right. Um, let's now uh, see how what the translators are supposed to do. The translators are supposed to work in another way. They work in what we call the simplified view. I click the button now, which takes me to the simplified view, which has one big button. And this is the button the translators are supposed to press. I'm clicking the button now. It takes me to a location and there I have a term base, which I previously converted to an Excel file. I'm double clicking this Excel file and waiting. Now the conversion is over and I get the possibility to save the ready QA checker file to um, the same location from where I started the process. Then I can load this QA checker file into Studio. And uh, the exported QA checker profile produced in the last video need to be imported into the given project in Trans Studio. This is done via the project settings and the result looks like that. And from this point on, the QA checker will verify the terminology. Let me add a few words about Tatra term. You, as you might expect, it is language per specific. Uh, the source language is English, always. Uh, on the target side, uh, it is adjusted to nearly all official languages. It is Excel-based, as already said. Um, Tantra term uh, works in four different ways. It, uh, it allows for conversion of terms li term lists uh, to QA checker profiles. This is uh, what you have seen uh, in the last presentation. It allows for extraction of legal defined terms from published acts, uh, for import of terms from term bases and for IATA comparison. The fact that Tatra term needs to be language specific is nothing strange if you consider the differences between, between the languages. We are, for example, used to the concept of different endings. Uh, here, an example from Romanian. Um, but what if the endings are not the only change? Let's see an example from Irish. Here you see all the forms of the word president in, in Irish. As you can see, Irish has both endings and the so-called initial modifiers. This increases the level of complexity, of course. And of course, the complexity does not stop here. But we do, because we don't have time for more. The tool is rule-based, um, as all other tools I have presented today, which uh, makes it very accurate. Uh, if it produces false positives, humans can usually grasp the reason easily and discard such false alarms. This is important since we want to decrease the cognitive load and not add to it. In the future, we would like to turn it into a plugin, but this of course requires additional resources. It's time to sum up. You have seen an overview of the IT supported quality assurance landscape in DGT. The landscape consists of four tools and covers common errors, terminology consistency, and a trusted auto-suggest. These tools are all meant to reduce the cognitive load for our translators and to make their work less cumbersome and faster. If you have any questions, uh, now it's time to ask them. And thank you for your attention. 
Thank you. And in fact, we do have a number of questions for you, which I'm going to go straight on to because we've only got a few minutes to um, to answer them. Uh, and we're also seeing us. Um, uh, so we can see them on the screen. Uh, Luis Costa, are these custom DGT tools available for freelancers and LSPs working for DGT? Uh, no, unfortunately, they are not. Uh, we are legally. Uh, it's um, it's it's a legal issue. Okay, is there any possibility that legal issue can be overcome in any way, do you think, in the future? Um, I'm, I'm not a legal expert, uh, it's, uh, but, uh, but um, they, they, they will probably not be overcome in the near future, no. Okay, sorry about that. Um, then we have a question, are SDL Trados developers aware of your improvements of their quality verification tools? At least some of them would be useful to other users as well. Do we have any SDL trans developers in the audience? Um, it's, I think uh, we probably do. Yeah, well, then they are aware. It's uh, they 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 have been presented uh, before. So uh, so I I think I have not. We have not presented them to SDL Trados uh, directly, but uh, but SDL Trados. Uh, uh, have uh, listened to our uh, request to uh, to improve the QA checker, which we are very grateful for. Uh, so, so we have had a, a cooperation on that. But uh, but these developments, no, they at least the, the last one, the, the the Tatra term one, is is uh, definitely not known to them. But the QA checker regexes are known to them. Hope it answers the question. Thank you. Uh, we have an anonymous question asking, will Tatra term be available to other EU institutions other than the Commission? It's a beautiful question. The answer is yes, it, it's actually already available. Uh, we have shared it with the other institutions. We did it uh, last year. So uh, if you're coming from another institution, well, just push me an email. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, we have uh, Lewis who says, uh, are the auto suggestions from the plugin coming from the regex rules, meaning it will only work if the reg regex rules are defined? Sorry for my pronunciation yes. if that is not correct. Uh, it was perfectly correct. Regex rules, definitely. definitely uh, but uh, um, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, it 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 comes. Every, everything is regex based. Everything is is rule based in these tools, and uh, and uh, and the the uh, the meaning of of this is to to give a trusted auto suggest. So it shall only be triggered in 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 very defined situations, and people need to trust it because they they need to trust it blindly so to say right so so yes it, it comes from regex rules and um, if they are not defined uh, nothing will come okay thank you uh, last two questions lucas uh, do you think it is it feasible that clients could themselves use these semi-automated checks in a web-based cap tool to post edit low risk internal use documents yeah uh it it is yeah, of course it's feasible. Yeah, um, but uh, but this would probably this would probably require some some training, right? Uh, yeah, but it it is possible. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And the last question, Georgi uh, says, do you work with freelancers using other Trados compatible CAP tools? Um, as, as far as I, I, I don't understand, I, I don't know other Trados compatible. Can. Oh, you, it's our, our okay. Yeah, now I understand it. Our freelancers are, are free to choose the cat tool they uh, they wish. Uh, so uh, so we we do not impose uh, the cat tool on our freelancers. Um, you can work on on whatever cat tool you you want. Uh, we just want uh, content which is readable by by our cat tool. That means an SDL XLIF. Okay, wonderful. Well, thank you very much indeed, Gregos. Uh, I hope that was a little bit better, the pronunciation this time. Uh, oh, and perfect. we will thank now you. move swiftly on uh, to our second live demonstration. Uh, and after that, as this time, there will be questions for your, um, for you, uh, time for your questions. So please do send them in as you're watching and as they occur to you.
Um, in this demonstration, we're going to see how the interactive term uh, terminology for Europe database, or IATE, which we've already heard a bit about, can be integrated into the CAT environment. The system is being demonstrated by Paolo Thoria Agut, who is IATE tool manager at the Translation Centre for the Bodies of the EU. Paola, it's over to you. Thank you very much uh, for uh, having me here. Thank you for the introduction, Aminda. So uh, yes, I will present today um, the latest work we have done uh, integrating IATE data uh, in, uh, in CAT tools and particularly in Trades Studio, which is the, the, the CAT tool being used uh, in the EU institutions uh, in most of the translation services of, of the institutions. So I'm gonna uh, share my screen. One second now, okay, so I'm, should, should be there, I think. Can you confirm, Aminda, that you can see my screen properly? Yes, it's perfect, thank okay. you. Okay, okay, great, thank you, thank you, it's reassuring. Okay, so um, let's, let's move, uh, one second, I'm, Okay, so I IATE offers uh, since uh, already some time ago an, an, an term, a term recognition module that we also call uh, TRM uh, in an abbreviated form. Um, uh, so and it's uh, um, dedicated to internal internal users. So it's not open for external users, unfortunately. Um, and this uh, module can be used uh, via the IATE user interface by uploading a document. Um, having it processed uh, in IATE and getting back uh, a term base as an output, uh, or can also be called via the T IATE TRM APIs directly. So uh, in order to automate workflows with a, with a pre-processing stage, and we have some um, uh, institutions and bodies having already done this, this automation. Um, so uh, this, this, this module um, uh, works with dedicated engines that do uh, text extraction, um, uh, language uh, analysis, uh, and also the conversion into the final output, so that they do all the processing, including the comparison against IATE data and, uh, and the, the detection of the best matches uh, available in the, in the database. Um, so that you have an idea of, uh, of the use of this feature. Um, uh, so far in 2021, we have received 45,000 uh, requests for uh, documents to be processed. So that you get an idea of the, of the volumes uh, that, that we are treating. Uh, the development that, that we have done this year in 2021 um, has been uh, a plugin uh, with, in fact, two plugins um, uh, to use this feature directly from IATE Trados Studio, from the 2019 version uh, and the 2021 version. These um, uh, plugins uh, consist of uh, two different features, um, what we call the term recognition um, asynchronous or the batch task. This is a, a feature that uh, uh, takes the, the document of the, of the active project uh, in a studio <clears throat> and uh, sends it to IATE and uh, the user, after uh, some minutes of waiting time, uh, gets back a local term base with the IATE matches that it's automatically loaded to the studio project. So the user, just by clicking on a button, um, launches the whole uh, process and gets back uh, the result uh, with an information message with when, when the local term base is it's, it's ready. Um, then uh, the second feature, it's um, a nicer one. It's a, a live uh, consultation, live connection to IATE for a more synchronous, almost synchronous um, recognition. And it's segment based. So the active segment and the next segments are sent to IATE and uh, there is an immediate uh, processing uh, with all the uh, yeah, term recognition uh, engines that I have mentioned before, uh, and uh, all the processing language analyzers and, and uh, output. And then the results come back uh, immediately uh, for uh, the active segment and the next ones. So um, uh, I, will, I will demo this in, in, a, in a minute. 
So um, you may you may have um, used uh, um, especially external external uh, users, um, external linguists. You may have used the, the open source, the existing open source IATETRADOS uh, Studio plugin. Um, and you may be wondering which are the main differences with our internal uh, plugin and why we have developed uh, something if there was already something available. Um, so uh, first of all, uh, it's the security aspect, so um, uh, which is a very important one. Where, where, where are we sending uh, the content of our documents um, and uh, having it processed and how long the content is stored there and uh, whether it's encrypted or not. So these are very important questions that with, uh, with external tools, we cannot always answer. So uh, that's why with our internal plugin, um, we, we manage um, um, the, the content within the IATE infrastructure, uh, which is managed by the IATE support and development team, uh, following a security plan that has been um, endorsed, um, uh, analyzed and endorsed by, by the uh, different IT uh, services, uh, information and, and IT security of, of the IATE partners, so of the EU institutions. So this is a, this is a let's say a, a key aspect. Then um, secondly, um, our internal plugin uses uh, the APIs and the engines uh, I have mentioned. So uh, the IAT specific uh, developed ones, TRM standard and uh, what we call TRM Live for the synchronous mode. Um, so uh, we let's say that uh, we have uh, the possibility to correct, to improve uh, following user's feedback. This is not always possible with uh, external or third party tools. I mean, you can send feedback, but then you, you are never sure whether this will be taken on board or not. So with our internal uh, development team, um, we can really improve our engines um, as, as needed and as requested by, by the users. Then um, we also offer uh, many uh, filters that are only open to internal users, so uh, uh, users with a specific profile. So the internal plugin connects to IATE with an internal role that gives access to uh, advanced filtering options not available with uh, the open source one and also um, internal data. Um, here I have to say that most of IATE data are available for external users, but um, a small minority of non-validated data or uh, raw data that we call pre-IATE data uh, are only available for internal users. And in this case, uh, uh, with the internal plugin, they, they have the possibility to, to retrieve them as well. Um, and then we have this, um, uh, let's say, two, mo two modes uh, with a local term base uh, for those users that uh, want to exploit additional features uh, in uh, Trados Studio um, that are not necessarily all available with a terminology provi provider. Uh, it's also useful, the local term base, when you don't have a, a very performant connection. And nowadays with telework, this is a, an important point as well. Um, while for the terminology provider, since you are sending queries constantly and receiving the results, you really need to have a, a very good connection. So these are, let's say, the, the, the main differences and um, the ex justification why we have developed our own um, internal plugin. Um, then um, uh, uh, other highlights that are uh, worth mentioning is that uh, we have included uh, um, we had a very long list of, uh, of uh, user requirements for, for the plugin and we have tried to, to cover as much as possible. So apart from the numerous filters available to reduce uh, the noise, the low quality, uh, to focus uh, the results on a specific domain, um, we also have the, the offer the possibility to save the favorite settings, to easily restore the default values, um, the output that we get in the term base uh, contains the IATE metadata as chosen by uh, the IATE partner. So the term is accompanied by key information um, that the central terminology services uh, have agreed on. And then um, uh, the plugin is consulting a copy of IATE data that is refreshed every three hours. So 
that's also a, um, an important point uh, to mention. I will now show you the, the demo of both features. So I'm going to now switch to, to uh, uh, the tool. And uh, I will start by generating a local term base uh, for the whole document via the task, uh, batch task feature, which is uh, a one additional feature that when you install this plugin, um, uh, it's made available here in the menu of batch tasks. So um, I, I launch this and uh, we will see, um, okay, that the wizard opens. And uh, when clicking on next, uh, we get here all the filters available for uh, users, for the internal users of this plugin. So we can, uh, by default, we are searching, we are going to retrieve results in all the domains, all the subject areas, but we can um, be more selective and, and decide that we only want uh, yeah, legal um, terms or terms in the finance or economics uh, domain. So, so here the, the users have flexibility. We are offering a set of default filters, filters also as agreed by uh, the central terminology services of all the institutions that are uh, IAT partners. Um, so by default, we are not uh, uh, going to retrieve target terms with very low reliability. So we start with minimum reliability. Um, and also by default, we are excluding preyate, what we call preyate, which is raw, uh, raw data. Uh, so terms, target terms that are marked with preyate uh, metadata. And uh, also maybe interesting uh, to mention is that um, we also have um, kind of uh, um, completion um, um, score uh, indicator, uh, which um, shows how rich, uh, how rich uh, uh, a target uh, a target entry or, or source it, it is uh, if it has uh, if it's well documented contains a reference uh, a note uh, a definition and so on and we give points according to the richness of, of the completion of this section of the IAT entry and we are by default excluding um, uh, let's say uh, from um, uh, uh, all the content that uh, has any score, so from the minimal to the maximal. So we start with an average score, score which is already entries we have a minimum uh, value of completion. So we are leaving out uh, poor content in principle. Here we have the buttons that I was mentioning about loading, uh, saving your, if you change your, your filters, you can save your, your, um, your values for later loading. Uh, and reset to the defaults uh, easily. So I will just uh, stay with the default values. I will launch the request. The request is being launched. Okay. And now uh, I can open my document and start working. And when the term base, the local term base is ready and attached to my project, I will get an alert. In the meantime, I'm going to show you the terminology provider um, so that you also can have a look at this, the live term recognition. Um, and then we will come back again to the local term base when it's loaded. Um, so the, 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 term, the IAT uh, the terminology provider uh, can be loaded uh, as any other term base, but we have the specific option when the plugin is installed, IAT CRM terminology provider. Um, when clicking on it, we go to the same filtering uh, window that we show already for the batch task. So we are offering the same filtering possibilities for both uh, features. Um, I, again, I will not um, apply any additional filters. I will just leave the defaults um, and then I will accept. So um, for the first segment um, or uh, for the first segment, it, it takes usually uh, some seconds. Uh, now it loaded very quickly because I was al already doing some tests before, but usually the user has to be a bit patient and maybe wait around 10 seconds, something like this. Uh, we have been as well um, uh, playing uh, with the um, type of machines that we are using for the processing. Um, because this plugin is not yet in production, it's currently being signed by SDL and as soon as it is ready uh, and signed in the coming days, then we will distribute it um, for production purposes for, to all the IAT partners 
and then uh, we plan to change the type of the machines. Now we have like uh, medium uh, machines and we will go to double powerful machines to make sure the performance is the best possible. And then we will see we still need to reinforce the infrastructure because we have a very scalable infrastructure um, that uh, yeah, will allow us to adjust to uh, proper and acceptable performance timing. But OK, I now already have the results. The good news is that when you have already in the past used the provider and you have already set your hit list settings um, to display some specific metadata uh, in the term recognition window, this is uh, memorized, let's say, for future sessions and future projects. So you don't need to uh, go back to the hit list settings and set them again. Uh, for every project. This is particularly for the terminology provider. For the batch task, it's really project specific and you need to repeat the exercise. But the provider, they come um, yeah, by default once you have set them the first time. In this case, I have set the to see the IAT. We can see them here. To see the IAT, um, <coughs> the IAT ID, sorry, the reliability of the term, the owner, the owner of the target term and if available, the evaluation value, which is the preferred, obsolete, deprecated status, which is very important as well when taking a decision. So um, since uh, there is a preloading, so I'm not only um, when, when the segment, the active segment is being processed, it's not only that one, it's also the next X ones and this number of segments that are preloaded in the background, you can define them uh, in a customized way. So uh, at the moment it's set to 10, but it, it can be enlarged uh, or it can be as well uh, reduced. Um, then in principle, if you follow the normal flow of the document, you don't need to wait for, uh, yeah, for the results because they are already preloaded. You only need to, to wait if you jump to the end of the document uh, because that's too far from the active segment or if you um, um, or or if you change your your settings while working which is a possibility that you have i will come back to this message because it means that uh, our local term base the one i just launched um, it's now ready but i will just leave it in the background and i will finalize showing you this so you as i mentioned you have the possibility to come back again now to the settings and change them <clears throat> if you see that you are getting too many results or too few results and you want to narrow or to enlarge your um, uh, search in IATE for, for matches, you can come and change it um, and then um, you load it again and then you have a waiting time because the segment is reprocessed so that a new uh, request is sent and you may have uh, some seconds waiting time. But uh, otherwise, uh, it's relatively quick if you follow the flow of the document and the, the, the results are preloaded for you. And this we are consulting IATE live um, directly. Uh, you can see as well uh, more information about the matches uh, that are presented to you in the, the term, uh, term based viewer. So here you have some more metadata like the term reference, you have a link to the uh, to IATE, to the full entry where you can see all the metadata, other languages and so on. Um, so this link brings you directly to, to IATE. And uh, yeah, and then here you have the index of the results preloaded for the current and the next segments. So this is uh, it about the, um, about the, uh, the sorry, the, the terminology provider. Uh, now I will get back to the message to load my local term base. It will remove me the um, provider. Uh, you can use both of them together, but uh, first you have to load the local term base and then and only then the terminology provider. So now I will accept and, um, and now I will get results. But this time they are a little bit slightly different. You don't see the metadata that I was seeing for, for the provider. And you also see that the source, it's not the provider anymore. It's, a, it's an SDLTB file, um, which is the local term base. So it's loaded here uh, automatically for you when, when it gets uh, ready. And um, in principle, I shall get the same matches because it's the same engines working behind. Um, and uh, yeah, and in this case, 
I'm not now querying IAT uh, segment by segment, but uh, I have a local term base with uh, the matches for all the documents. So I could even work without any connection, so fully offline. So again, as well, we have a term-based viewer where we can see more information about the entry and uh, there is a link to the IAT entry again. The display is slightly different, but uh, uh, it has more metadata, uh, the, 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 the local term base has more metadata. We have definitions, uh, we have some notes that we don't offer in the terminology provider to really uh, reduce the amount of information being transferred because it's a synchronous uh, transfer and, and it's more demanding. So um, uh, we offer- Paula, yes. th this is Aminda, can I just uh, ask you to wrap up because we've got lots of questions and we've only got a little <laughs> okay. bit of time. Okay, okay, thank you, thank you for, for letting me know. Uh, yes, this, this was the demo, so I'm, I'm done with the demo. I'll come back uh, one second to the presentation, but uh, that's what I wanted to show. Uh, here, if the presentations are circulated, users will see which features, terminology features are available for each of the uh, plugin features. Um, the verifier and the, the term-based search are not available with the provider. Uh, and uh, that's it, uh, because uh, yeah, the, the other, the next steps will be following up with uh, with the users once in production, seeing if we scale the infrastructure, analyzing the integration with group share, and seeing if we still need more filters. But uh, that's that's what I wanted to to present. So I'm done, and I'm ready and ready for the questions. Okay, the, great. The well, let's throw, show them immediately on the screen, and let's go to the top one. In fact, Constantin has been very busy sending in lots of questions. We're also going to be hearing from him in the presentation shortly. Um, so the top voted one: Do you have the technology for bilingual terminology extraction? Uh, no, this bilingual terminology. Uh, uh, here I'm, I've been talking uh, about terminology, ter term recognition, not really term extraction. Um, do, we do have in IATE another module, which is the term extraction module. For the moment, just bilingual, uh, just sorry, just monolingual. So you can upload a document. It's also an, a feature for internal users. You you load a document, and you are gonna get back uh, a list of uh, term candidates with some metadata for you to uh, analyze whether um, you want to take them on board for creating new entries, for enriching existing ones. Uh, bilingual terminology extraction is foreseen in, in, in the coming months, so it's the work program for 2022. We have already explored it a little bit and we will work more on it, but uh, what I have presented, it, it was really term recognition, was not a term extraction. Yeah. Okay, and his second question, which has had 10 votes, Constantin, is this available for other TMS CAT tools? Uh, the APIs are there to be used with any tool. Uh, so uh, now what we have done, the, the development I have presented is the specific uh, development uh, to be used within uh, Trados Studio. Um, so it's really tool specific, uh, it's, it's tool specific, but uh, it's using uh, this plugin is querying the IAT term recognition APIs, which are uh, standard APIs and which can be used uh, in other uh, tools uh, and uh, yeah, integrated in, even in, in workflow uh, tools and not necessarily CAD tools. Um, so the APIs are, are there to be exploited as needed. Mm -hmm. Okay, and a similar question from uh, Sarah, is this new plugin available from uh, MemoQ Capital? Yeah, the plugin no, because it has been developed specifically for the CAT tool being used in the EU institutions, which is not MemoQ, it is, uh, it is a studio. Um, but uh, the, let's say the feature, the term recognition engines, we have the APIs and if at some point uh, MemoQ would be a tool uh, used internally, we would uh, of course be able to, to do uh, a similar development. 
Okay, uh, next question with uh, six votes. We have another one from Constantine, who's obviously been following this very closely and has lots of questions. Are you working on tools to create terminology domain classification ontology automatically or to reconcile different ontologies? Mm -hmm. Yeah, very interesting question. We are not working uh, concretely, but we have been exploring the possibilities uh, since last year, we have a working group together with the um, uh, colleagues from the publications office and particularly the Eurovoc, uh, Eurovoc team. And uh, we are uh, opening doors uh, for, uh, yeah, for, for, for this. Uh, so I wouldn't say ontologizing yet uh, because we are talking about uh, a very classical terminology database and we are talking about more than one uh, almost almost one million entries right now so it's enormous and we cannot just uh, yeah uh, build relations and so on for such a big amount of content but we are focusing on a small data sets and see what we can achieve and uh, we have already some concrete proposals on the table for the beginning of next year with the colleagues from the publications office that we will explore in more detail and then if uh, there is there are interesting uh, outcomes we will share them yeah. okay thank you we've still got some more questions and we've got a couple of minutes so maybe we can cram in another couple can we see another couple on the screen please thank you um okay ha good one this one what happens when the eu institutions purchase a different cap tool in the future Yes, well, this means um, redeveloping all, a lot of customizations that have been done for for the current one. But um, uh, in the last uh, in the last tendering procedure, uh, it was the studio that was selected again. So I think it's here to stay for for the next few years. So we don't envisage changes uh, next year. So usually this tendering is done for for several years. Uh, to make sure there is a stability, of course, for the users, for, for the workflow uh, and for all the tools that uh, uh, are developed around it. But, but of course, if one day the tool changes, uh, plenty of customizations will need to be adjusted to the new tool. Okay, right. Well, thank you very much indeed. I think we'll finish that there. Um, thanks, Paula. Um, thank you. Most thank interesting. you. Thank and you. we're now going to go move swiftly on to our third live demonstration, which is being given by Constantine Dranch, who we've just been looking at all those questions you've been sending in. Um, uh, you've obviously feeling very well prepared for your presentation. Uh, he's a translation industry observer and co-founder of Custom MT. He's going to give us a look at what's new in automation. And of course, don't forget to send in your questions to him uh, after this demo. Demo, uh, which will be in around 20 minutes time. Constantine, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Amanda. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, uh, everyone else has been given a, given a presentation, very detailed and very specialized presentations of tools. I don't have a presentation of tool for you today. Instead, I'm uh, speaking today in my research capability to, uh, together with you, discuss uh, what has happened uh, to the language technology in the last year and maybe what's going to happen in, in the next year, right? So it's going to be a high level overview of the new tech and how it changes our working lives. So I hope you'll enjoy and have some fun. Don't uh, uh, expect a very uh, detailed uh, technical presentation that's uh, on the other shoulders today. Before I begin, uh, may I ask you uh, to all the participants a question? What do you think? is the main change for this year and what's coming up in the next year. Please write that on the chat. I don't have access to the chat, but maybe Aminda you can uh, follow and in the end we'll compare uh, what I think is was important and is important and what the audience thinks. Uh, perhaps there'll be a very interesting suggestions coming from the feed. With this, I will begin. Uh, so let's see where we are this past year in a global economic situation has been very, very fast rebound, right? So the COVID hasn't ended, but the dread and fear which the business has felt, the, the disruptions have turned around. And as you can see, both the GDP uh, growth all around the world is all green. And uh, 
what happened is that all this capital, which was waiting to go and find its target, uh, the investors just went around all the IT companies that were worth their salt, all the tech companies, even in the language technology, and just told them, shut up and take our money. And they gave them uh, twice the amount of money that they usually give on a, on a good year. So it has been a huge bubble, unprecedented amount of uh, cash uh, going into technology, the technology companies then uh, hired uh, a lot of people, salaries got inflated, then they bought a lot of advertising. So Google made 70% more profit than usual. So it's a great year economically for, for the world. Maybe not everyone is included, but the overall trend is here. And so for the language technology, I think this uh, also going, uh, this, uh, this, this investment bubble is also going on there. And we'll see many more technologies uh, getting bigger and springing up after 2021. Now, in more specifics related to language technology, right? So what happened? What was the biggest change? The biggest change was that uh, we all went into hundreds or sometimes even thousands of online meetings. And not only individual meetings, but also big conferences and uh, congresses, uh, including the European Parliament meetings, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, FIFA assemblies, the uh, World Health Organization congresses, and so on. So what this led to is that the interpreting technology, like all interpreting used to happen in the booths around these beautiful rooms in Brussels, Luxembourg, and Geneva, then it all went online. And so the interpreting uh, companies, which provide the software, for remote interpreting uh, became institutionalized, right? So uh, the, there's about 50 different uh, companies which provide a, a remote simultaneous conference interpreting and three of them, uh, which were closest to the United Nations, to uh, the European Parliament, European Commission, and so on, they went big. Uh, all of them uh, first in the past year, they went six times uh, in sales this time they doubled in sales, so they, uh, they, they actually went from almost nothing in, uh, in the user base to become uh, to very large and important with tens of millions of dollars in sales. Furthermore, investors queued up to their doors and they gave them a lot of funding. Uh, more than $50 million was funneled to these uh, companies. That's even more than uh, all of their sales combined, so investors just uh, saw the uh, clientele from amongst the uh, United Nations groups, the large corporates, the, uh, the European Parliament, and they, uh, they stuff these companies full of money, disregarding whether uh, they're here to stay or not. So they got quite big. And because they got bigger, uh, well-funded, they, they, they've grown to teams of 200 people uh, more, uh, they became institutionalized. So they're here to stay and they're going to become uh, big innovation hubs for uh, meeting technology. So first, uh, this last month, two of them launched uh, captioning for meetings. So they now have uh, proprietary technology uh, for speech recognition, integrations with speech recognition, and they can provide captionists who uh, take notes of the meetings. They provide meeting support. And I think the next thing which was going to come from these companies is machine interpreting. Right. So we've been talking about machine translation for many years, but um, that's just the beginning. Right? Uh, what prevents those companies from launching um, an option not only to uh, transcribe what's going on on the, on the page, translate it, but also to give it a voice. And uh, I'm sure they're already working on this and we're going to see this. Maybe not in a very good quality. So if I were to uh, be transcribed right now by Zoom or by another provider, the quality would be okay. But if I was transcribed, translated, and then voiced by the machine, each time there'll be a 20-30% loss in quality so in the end, resulting in uh, uh, quite poor uh, machine interpretation. But that could work uh, in some scenarios, perhaps not for an official meeting of the United Nations or Ford, machine, uh, Ford Motor Company, but maybe for uh, I don't know, someone listening in the webinar and they want to listen to that webinar, not in English, but in Slovenian or in Spanish or in some other language. 
and there is no interpreter provided, so they can press the button and get the machine interpretation going on in their own language at a fraction of the cost of the human interpreter. So you know how there's been a many years of resistance to machine translation from translators. Is machine translation going to take away our jobs? So be prepared for the next five years of resistance. Is machine interpreting going to take away our jobs? Here are a few examples. Um, uh, these are the captioning uh, interfaces in those providers. This is on the left how uh, stenography used to be done by typists with uh, phonetic keyboards. It's still uh, a thing, it's still going on, and uh, actually the UN organizations are using human uh, uh, captioning, which is more accurate, especially with names. Uh, I mean, the earlier you uh, we're practicing the pronunciation of uh, Gregor's last name, so the same goes to the machine. If it was to, um, uh, to, to listen being said, it might not transcribe it perfectly, but a, a stenographer with a good machine and a, a previous list of all the names might do it correctly. However, the change would be that the stenographer works in an interface where the machine transcribes, maybe the glossary is integrated, and they can also fix it on the fly, right? So there's a uh, you can see they will see the video, they'll have some settings, and they'll be able to uh, see each line as it appears and just adjust uh, what the machine got wrong. And that would be a pretty workable scenario. You can even connect a voice to it. Second big change, and I'm going to speak mostly about synthetic right now. I know many of the people here are translators and are interested in translation tools. Translation tools didn't change much in the past year, right? There's a kind of stagnation in innovation in translation tools. The companies are getting bigger. They build up sales team, marketing team. They get uh, in, invested into by investors. They eat each other up, but uh, there has not been a disruptive innovation in uh, translation. However, in the world of um, generation of synthetic video, synthetic voice, synthetic uh, text, there has been a breakthrough with the transformer technology and this technology has made its way to the market and it's becoming productized. So this is what I think is very new and this is going to have a profound effect on all the language industry and here, are, here is how. So let's look at voice. Um, before uh, we used to uh, see software which has speech recognition uh, embedded into some online editor so you could uh, quickly add captions to a video and then quickly translate them, right? So this has been on the market for five, ten years, seven years. Uh, however, what changed this year is huge investment and in this development in the area of AI voices or uh, text to speech. So uh, the, the, the computer would read to you uh, what you uh, have written. You can see here just uh, in the last few months, uh, uh, quite a few companies raised money or uh, launched new technologies for AI voices and around this. Most of them provide the workbench to uh, create a voiceover. So here is one company which got $10 million this year to develop their interface. They have a number of engines which give you, I don't know, 100, 200, 300 different voices in different languages. You can put your text, it looks like this, the workbench, and then you press the button and it's generated into a voice. And it have, can be a male, female, happy, sad. Um, then you can also use uh, uh, some of these workbenches to adjust the pronunciation. Perhaps they don't get uh, the name right. Then you can uh, change a little bit the output and get the name right. And the pronunciation. Maybe uh, they end up in a robotic way or a little bit monotonous and you can add markup. So there's a SSML markup uh, which you can learn. It's not that difficult. And then uh, one person working from anywhere can have any voice, right? It could be uh, someone sitting in the Philippines, in Ukraine, in, um, uh, in India, uh, maybe even a team of sound engineers and they can uh, use one voice to quickly voice a huge number of videos. Like, for example, if you have uh, e-learning videos, you don't need the depth of human emotion, just a little bit. Uh, you, instead of having 
voice actors or dubbing actors go through all this. They will give it to engineers in a low cost zone. They run it through the tool. They automatically voice it at scale. And it comes with some emotion. It's readable. It's clear. It's better than untrained person trying to speak at all. Right? And this is what has come to the market. Uh, this is another interface. As you can see here, it's not just one file. It's uh, segmented sentence by sentence. And uh, uh, this actually is an Italian company which recently has made its way to a European Union accelerator, right? So it can be done at scale. Finally, uh, this Italian company launched an interface where you can do everything with the video. video. Let's say you have a, a clip in one language and it has some phrases spaced out in, in the clip. So it runs the clip through speech recognition, detects where this word sit, allows you to edit it, and then you press a button and it automatically voices it, translates it and voices it in another language. So your video can become available in 10 languages in less than an hour, right? If you're using a tool like this. And people will be using that uh, increasingly, mostly starting with uh, low risk clips, such as learning, support, maybe YouTube stuff. But um, as the quality progresses, we'll see more and more use cases. What's the effect on the industry here? You can work as an engineer on this, right? One person speaking one language can suddenly voice uh, clips into 10 languages um, sitting from home without even recording their voice. It can be someone who is just proficient with, with the software. They don't need to speak the language. They just need to put the markup in the right places and adjust the pronunciation. So there's post editing for this type of work. So I'm now going to show you a clip with uh, um, uh, with sound and I hope you like it. It's a, it's a collection of different companies uh, providing this AI voices and you'll see how naturally these voices sound. Let's see, it's one minute long. It's all going right, right? Yep, fine, thanks. So let's see it for one minute. Since the dawn of time, you'll see synthetic voices. Sessionados for la velocidad. Y para algunos, es el dije de Seth Eisenberg, que es la leyenda india de vida y de vulgo de vida de su ser. I can't work with you. You murdered her. As you can see, even with emotion, as you can hear. I want to talk as plainly and of as course, many of these companies put the president in there or someone. Much. Como ya visto, esta no es una convención normal. No es un momento normal. Not the best experience, right? This one comes with the lip sync. This is how AI dubbing is working. So as you can see, pretty good and. Um, it's available, it's inexpensive, it, everyone can do this. This is an example where a company even made a live translation. So you just saw, or you just heard a company which is doing live dubbing uh, with AI technology. There is no human involved, right? So this was one uh, made by Yandex, right? So. A lot of voices technology coming out uh, can be done for uh, machine interpreting, can be done for video localization, post editing is involved. And if you have a, a really interesting voice, I mean, I, have, I think you have a particularly interesting voice uh, among us. You can go to a platform, uh, one which was launched in May called Marvel AI. You can record your voice and you can license your voice. And every time somewhere in the world will be using your voice, they'll pay you a royalty, right? So if, even this is becoming uh, possible. So if you're like a celebrity, uh, who is the most uh, uh, famous actor of all time? I don't know, Sean Connery or uh, uh, the voice of Darth Vader, you can, uh, you can license that voice and a company can use it for everything. For example, if you want to, of your uh, business or organization always speak like Darth Vader, you can do that. Now, uh, this also comes with the ability now to create synthetic videos and synthetic video avatars. The one you saw last with lip sync was coming from Synthesia. There's a class of this uh, 
softwares, uh, not only Synthesia, but also Hippo and Rephrase AI. You can record yourself speaking in the camera, and then you can run this to create videos uh, of you speaking on uh, any topic in any language. Right? Uh, so this one, uh, Synthesia is already used for um, sports reporting. So this uh, person on the top left uh, is actually a synthetic avatar who is discussing the outcome of the match. And he can speak in any languages, so it's, it's a recording. It's also used for sales personalization, so we can say, hey, Aminda, would you like to buy my shiny new technology? And it could be sent by email at scale to uh, 100,000 uh, people, and each one will have a clip personalized for them with their own name. And it's, it can also be used in learning. Uh, for example, uh, dear Kirill, uh, your performance in the last academic quarter was lackluster. You should work harder. And it could be delivered by a synthetic avatar of your favorite dean. Here is an example. So this uh, is a video of my friend uh, Mario Junior, who runs a, a translation company in Portugal, and he is uh, hosting a conference on the topic of multilingual synthetic content. I asked him to make a video to promote the conference at the Russian event, and he doesn't speak any Russian, so you can see him here, he's going to speak Russian. This is a robot voice. As you can see, it's pretty lifelike, right? And um, this was done by a, um, my sister uh, and a engineer who was working on uh, on, uh, on Synthesia at a budget of, I think, $30 or something like this. And, of course, Mario can speak Russian and uh, he, he, he doesn't know a single Russian word, but uh, here his avatar can do that. So, many use cases, international organizations, businesses can have their own character or person who represents them, speaks in any language, and that character can be funnel or powered by technology and by a team of linguists that make it possible. Uh, recently, there's been hospital training videos done with this technology. Uh, some advertising is coming to be. So this is the beginning of a new market and the beginning of a new profession, a person who can create those videos at scale. Finally, text. In the beginning of the year, the uh, developers of, uh, uh, of technology have uh, shocked the world by uh, designing a neural network which can draw pictures uh, from text. So they asked uh, the, the neural network to draw an uh, armchair in the shape of avocado. And you can see that uh, it has done a pretty good job, better than a human, very creative. Uh, they can uh, draw storefronts, they can draw pictures of uh, cities now. So it's very powerful. The same works for text. So they have created interfaces to GPT-3 uh, transformer models where you can enter just a little bit of text and uh, give some parameters and it produces a whole write-up. So the technology arrived, it could do that, and the people were amazed at the quality of the writing, uh, very interesting, but they didn't know how to put it into business and the first businesses are starting to appear. So um, after these companies got funded and uh, promoted the idea a little bit this year, uh, which is happening, with, I mean, right now, right now, Translation companies have developed a offering to create product descriptions. So if you have an online store which sells a big number of, I don't know, clothing apparels or bottles of wine, and you have to populate a website with descriptions, you just give a table of contents. Is it a gray shirt? Is it a blue shirt? Is it a slim model? And so on. Um, provide some, so some snippets of content, and then you press a button and it generates a thousand product descriptions, which you can put on the website and get higher traction on Google, which creates another job, right? It creates a job of um, the person operating that system and the person who can look at the output and post it at this uh, electronic copywriter to make sure that there are no embarrassing mistakes and that it all makes sense. So computers can speak for us, computers can uh, show people uh, instead of us now, computers can write text for us. I just hope that uh, one day they'll be also be able to consume all this uh, pretty digital content instead of us so that we don't have to do anything. Right. Finally, to terminate for today, uh, last point uh, uh, is machine translation. It's the leitmotif of this conference and of course it's the uh, the, the area where I work in at Custom MT. Machine translation has been uh, on the rise this year. It's a record year 
in the number of projects run with post editing. Technology has not really advanced that much, but the adoption of the technology has uh, has grown a lot. Um, there's now more nuanced programs on the market. You can buy data to train. There's a whole uh, ecosystem of people who customize the models like us to make them more accurate. So if you have um, climate change machine translation, legal machine translation, you can have medical machine translation, any type uh, of domain, you can have terminology integrated in it and it's become very, very easy to train and to adapt. Many companies are uh, even uh, taking it further, developing machine translation engines from stock, uh, from, uh, from toolkits in-house. So this has become a trend just to uh, create a machine translation team and machine translation specialists. A new uh, class uh, of uh, uh, localization specialists has, have appeared specializing in this AI. And of course, there's a lot of work for them because there are so many domains and so many languages. What's coming up in machine translation is first multimodality, the ability for machine translation to see uh, the picture, the image, uh, break it up into parts, recognize different objects in the, the image and connect the text with the image. So it makes it slightly more accurate when you're translating videos, when you're uh, making multilingual uh, captions for videos, uh, or when you're performing a multilingual search on an uh, engine like Google. Uh, it's becoming more adept at uh, addressing gender bias. Uh, uh, the inclusivity uh, advocates, I think, are winning their fight big time. Uh, a lot of uh, gen gender inclusive uh, talk out there and machine translation companies are trying to comply. As you can see, uh, here is an example where Google uh, changed their output and uh, Google Translate is listening and others are listening as well. So this is getting addressed. And finally, here uh, a model is emerging where the head of localization, the head of translation department um, sets up a team in-house or outsourced, uh, which manages a lot of this AI, which uh, works with the complexity uh, of it and uh, different languages, and they just control and own the engines. My final words, I see that I think my time is running out. I have a couple of minutes left. Let's leave more time for questions and discussion. So what can you do here? What's your takeaway from this development of uh, synthetic, uh, uh, media, uh, text generation, speech generation, video generation of uh, interpreting technology, machine translation. Right, so these uh, developments just indicate uh, that uh, there's even more to come. Right, this, these developments create whole new areas to attack and uh, someone in the organizational structure will be made responsible for them in the next couple of years. So if you're working in-house, and if you're leading uh, localization or translation in-house, then you probably want to pivot uh, towards having more technology groups, right? If you give it all away, if you only concentrate on linguistics, then your ability to influence the future is going to be very limited. Instead, if you say we are a digital excellence center, digital competency center, which deals with multilingual and we're the best at it. And if you build these groups, um, for technology in-house, for new technology. If you promote the capable people who know how to do this, which have the uh, ambition and the drive to research this, uh, dive into this and uh, become specialists in a new area, then in, in a year time and two years time, you have uh, much more say in, in, in how things are done. It, then you are, um, controlling many different areas and you have many ways how to advance your career. If you're working on the vendor side, then it's important to recognize that this change must come for the clients and uh, to help them transition to more uh, digital um, workforce, to more digital teams that are focused on implementing one technology after another. The ability to dive into the new technology, uh, understand it, put into practice and make it useful for the organization. And then that dive into the next one and next one and next one is going to be important on in both uh, the sides of the uh, vendor and the buyer. And so I wish you a happy digitalizing and adopting of this technology. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Konstantin. Um, just to quickly go through some of the things that were posted in the chat. Uh, Louis said uh, Tech for 2022, hopefully commercially mature automatic MT quality estimation that will allow more no. fair payment to the translation translators. No. No. Okay. Uh, we have. I, I disagree. I mean, uh, who, uh, it, it, someone might find a, a way. I, I don't believe it's it's that cl close. Okay. Uh, Olga says she's very disappointed with Zoom's live transcription, so she has doubts about machine interpretation. Maybe she uh, changes those now to what she's seen in your demonstration. I don't know. Uh, uh, she can says, in, into any API from other providers, right? So you have an API from Zoom, you can plug in Microsoft, Google, Amazon, whatever, Speechmatics, whatever API you like. Right? So if you don't like, uh, uh, they, they bought a company in, in this area just in summer. They just worked on this for a few months. Uh, in a year, let's see where we get. And if you don't like what they offer, you can plug in whatever you have. Okay. Then we have Ellen saying trends and smart business seem not to match with a, a I think that's a, a um, you know, a winking face. Um, that something Barbara says TTS is still not good at intonation. Text to, uh, to speech, right? Um, yeah. It's getting better and you can use uh, markup. You can you have a post editor on uh, on AI voices to make the intonation better. It is now customizable, right? So maybe the automated engine is not 100% perfect, but uh, if you put the human in the loop, the expert, then uh, you can get very, very close. Okay, and last comment, um, and, and then I really want to go to questions because we've got seven, uh, but the comment was from Marta who says low cost zone and then puts a vomiting face. Uh, so, mm. <laughs> right, let's show the questions. Um, uh, I must say that when you said to me I could license my voice, of course, I was interested in that, but thank you, Michael, for sending me the question that occurred to me too. What safeguards are in place to prevent a voice becoming the voice of an undesirable entity? For example, an anti-vax group, a far-right political party, etc. Uh, there's a fight going on. Things are in the flux. The technology has arrived and everyone's discussing deep fakes. So companies, uh, not companies, countries will be creating the legislation against that kind of thing. And there'll be industry groups, watchdogs, scanners, which recognize whether your voice is real or, or fake. And uh, uh, there's an enormous possibility for both innovators and policymakers to, uh, to work on this right now. It's a, a fun area and uh, it can prevent a lot of uh, frustration, disappointment, or even crime in the future. So go get them. Okay, and perhaps also it's a, a thing that you should be putting into your contract if you want to be doing uh, your voice licensing. And again, uh, how you do you put in to... all the sub-clauses? I mean, like, <laughs> what you said in the course of this conference is already enough to create a likable, uh, believable uh, clone of your voice. So even if you didn't go to the company to license this, uh, if someone wanted to get your voice and copy it, they can. Uh, okay, all right. I don't want to think about that now. That sends shivers down my spine. Let's go to Zienia's uh, question. What is the difference in price for the client if using machine interpreting instead of a human interpreter? Machine interpreting is not here yet, right? Uh, at the moment, if you use it, it's usually free test and not really good. When it comes about, it's probably going to be 10 to 20 percent uh, of the cost, as, as much as the uh, as the buyer is willing to pay, but definitely a fraction of what a human interpreter costs. Maybe okay, even free then, in some cases. Okay, we won't go to the anonymous question because I think we've kind of uh, discussed the risks of licensing your voice. Uh, Fedzardi uh, says, or oh, in fact, it's da Davide, uh, what do you mean by you can have terminology integrated into your MT? Can you please give some specifics? Well, you can take a glossary uh, add to a machine translation model, and it will search and replace and make uh, much fewer uh, mistakes in terminology. There was a study done in Germany, I think, by Daniel Zielinski. They to Deepl, they put a terminology base into this, and the the they eliminated eliminated ninety eight percent of terminology mistakes. So, if your machine translation is not quite good, 
you can make it better. You can train it. You can add a uh, term base to this so that two operations to do, and you can make it pretty good unless it's a low resource language, something like Macedonian or uh, Inuktitut or something like this. Then it's going to be quite difficult to get the data. Otherwise, okay. if it's a big language uh, and uh, an important domain, there, there are so many ways to make it so, so much better. We usually, when we train, we can see a 30% to 100% improvement uh, like this. Okay, well, well, and you went like that, and we went, uh, the, the screen changed. You're a magician. That's very clever. <laughs> okay, well, Constantine, yeah, thank you very much indeed. Uh, that was an amazing, uh, yes, amazing to see some of that technology. Um, and also someone who's so super enthusiastic about it. And uh, uh, yes, so thank you very much indeed for that live demo. And we're now going to go on to our fourth and final thank live you. demonstration. Pleasure. Um, which is actually going to be presented by Two, uh, we're going to have two things presented. We're going to see a workflow automation tool for the translation industry, which is presented by a large LSP user, Paula Marginen, uh, from the Applications and IT Systems Development Unit at the European Parliament. And we'll also be having a demonstration of the integration of a quality estimation tool into the automated translation workflow given by Kirill Solovyev from uh, Content Quo. So there will be questions as before um, after their presentations. And so I will pass over the floor to Paula. Thank you very much, Aminda. We're gonna demonstrate today with Kirill how the use of um, Content Co uh, has been automated in the European Parliament uh, for the evaluation of the quality of outsourced uh, translations. Yeah, so just to be very clear, we're not going to demonstrate any quality estimation tools today, okay, uh, especially in light um, of what Constantine has mentioned, this technology is not here yet. We're going to demonstrate a workflow solution for doing translation quality evaluation uh, in a very uh, straightforward and uh, meaningful and objective and structured and fully human way, all right, so no AI on screen today, we've already seen quite a bit. Paula, uh, back to you. Thank you. I will share my screen. If you could give me rights, Lukash, please. Not yet. Okay. Sorry about this. I'm trying to share, but uh, I don't have rights. Maybe Kirill, you can try to share the presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, give it just a second. I'll try to get this up on screen as quickly as I can. Unfortunately, I don't have rights to share. Maybe something happened. Wonders of technology, it's never perfect. Yes. And the meanwhile, while we're getting this ready, I just say a couple of words on, on the workflow, since that's uh, what we're talking about today. Oh, it works. Oh, but go perfect. ahead, Kirill. Go ahead. Yeah, I think uh, this quality evaluation is a very uh, interesting part of the workflow. Uh, I think most of the freelance translators here are intimately familiar with uh, quality control, uh, which is what Grzegorz has been demonstrating in the beginning of the slot. But um, it feels like not many people are actually familiar with quality evaluation. Um, so this is a step of the workflow that happens after everything you could do to deliver a perfect translation has already been done and it's over on the client side. Okay, so this is exactly the part of the workflow that Paula and myself are going to cover today. So this is what happens when you send the files back to the parliament after applying whatever tools, machine translation engines, automatic quality control, and all the tricks that you had up your sleeve as a freelancer or as a translation agency to make it as perfect as possible. So this is what happens Next, uh, Paula, back to you. 
Thank you, Kirill. So um, we're going to talk about the automation of the workflow for uh, translation quality evaluation with Content Co. And um, um, sorry. Can you see my? Yeah. And we're going to talk about how translation happens at the European Parliament to just set uh, the context. I'll give you some figures so that you know a little bit about the workload that we have and why automation is essential. I'm going to just present you very shortly the automatic pre-processing of our outsourced packages because it makes um, the automation of the evaluation at the end a logical uh, continuation of that work. We are going to show you how the post-processing of delivered translations is um, automated. And uh, we're going to talk a little, a little bit about the quality evaluation in Content Co with Kirill doing a, a live demo. And all of this in order for the evaluation results to be uh, fed back into our workflow tool so that they can be pre pre uh, they can be processed for payment and also for um, dynamic ranking in some of our contracts. The Parliament has a dedicated Director General for Translation that uh, offers um, translation services to um, our uh, members and also to the administration. We translate procedural texts uh, that will be debated in the, uh, the plenary, in the parliamentary committees and delegations and also other fora. We also translate exchanges with the other institutions uh, of the European Union or uh, the national authorities and with citizens. And we also work a lot with administrative documents, tender documents, communications from our colleagues uh, in other DGs and so on. But we're not doing only translation. We also offer other services like editing of original texts, subtitling, voiceover, summarization, and so on. We cover the 24 official languages, which gives 552 language combinations. Um, rest assured, we are not doing that directly. We have a pivot system because otherwise it would be a little bit too much. And one thing that is specific to the European Parliament is multilingual originals. And you'll see in uh, Kirill's demonstration that that has an impact also on uh, the evaluation of our outsourced translations. In terms of volume, we are already close to 2 million pages in 2021, uh, out of which 33.74% uh, were outsourced, which represented more than 10,200 outsourced assignments. What does that mean? That means that we had to do more than 10,200 evaluations for outsourced assignments. How do we do that? We do that with automation because otherwise we could not uh, cover the whole volume. And we have created our own tools to, uh, to do that. This is how our IT landscape uh, looks like. I'm not going to go through all of it because this is the time we have is not enough. We're going to just go through the automation of our outsourced packages and uh, then the evaluation packages. So for outsourcing, we create automatically uh, the translation packages, as well as for internal translation, there are similar packages. These include the translation resources that are added to cascading memories, the SDL XLIF files that are already pre-translated against the normative memories and the main reference documents to ensure consistent reuse. Um, like uh, Grzegorz and uh, Paula said before, uh, the Parliament is also using um, Trados uh, Studio, so SDL XLIF files. We have a workload calculation based on uh, the amount of reuse that is available in the memories. And in each package, we also have a safe working protocol that gives step-by-step -step instructions on how to use those cascading memories. Also, for those uh, freelance uh, and 
freelance translators and companies that work with us and that choose to use a different CAD tool, we uh, provide the original files and all the resources uh, so that they can use their uh, CAD tool of choice. So this is what we send to our freelance uh, or to our um, external translators in general, be them freelance or um, companies. And what we expect back from them is an XLIF that will be introduced in the automatic post-processing uh, system that is called very non-creatively quality assurance service, stands for short QAS. This is a service that was developed in close cooperation between our quality coordination unit, our development uh, team and Kirill and his team at uh, Content Co. And what uh, it does, it integrates Content Co directly with our outsourcing tool so that it can um, automatically retrieve the deliverable from uh, the external translator. And uh, it integrates Content Co with our internal workflow tool so that the language units are immediately warned when a delivery is available have their evaluation package created and available in their workflow tool without having to go to a, uh, a different application. What the um, automatically created evaluation package uh, contains is the XLI file that was delivered by our freelance translator. If we are talking about a multilingual package, uh, that we outsourced, we will have as many XLIFs in the deliverable as language combinations through, uh, to that target language. The package also includes all the reference files um, that might be needed for the uh, evaluator to have at hand during the evaluation. And the um, package will automatically sample the part of the deliverable that will have to be evaluated based on the following rules. 15% in general of the delivered translation will be assessed. That's a minimum of two pages and a maximum of 7.5 pages. All assignments that are lower than two pages will be completely um, assessed. And for multilingual assignments, the, the sample that Content Co will choose automatically will be um, will contain the uh, same percentage of um, source languages as the uh, initial assignment. So if you have an assignment with French, English and Romanian uh, in, um, in the assignment, the sample that Content Co will create automatically for assessment will have the three languages in the same proportion as the original. The um, contract that we have with freelancers provides that for technical reasons or for quality reasons, a translation can be re-delivered either um, at our request or because the um, external contractor decides to do so. And these re-deliveries will also be treated automatically. Rest assured, human interventions are still needed. So exactly like Kirill was saying earlier, we've just automated the workflow part. The rest of the work, the assessment proper is still done by a human, um, by one of our um, translators, um, in-house translators. The only other intervention that uh, still remains to be done um, manually for the moment is assigning the uh, evaluation task two specific evaluators uh, in, in each team. But the rest of the process has now been um, automated. And one of the, um, what would be the, the, the advantages is we have a um, structured um, storage and archiving system. File names are all the same. Um, and that creates consistencies. The evaluation grid is um, set in Content Co and applied uh, automatically. And I think the uh, gain, the most obvious gain is the gain of time. We have those 10,000 and something evaluation packages created automatically so that uh, the users don't have to 
keep checking whether their translation arrived and do the pack and create the packages uh, manually. I'll hand over now to Kirill for a demo. Thank you, Paula, for the perfect introduction. And I'm very happy that we're partnering with uh, DG Translation at the Parliament to save quite a big amount of taxpayer money on automating the, the non-value added work that inevitably exists in such large-scale workflows. Uh, for those of you listening to us and wondering what, what the uh, what, what are we actually talking about? Oh, please don't uh, don't be so harsh on yourselves. This is actually one of the most large scale and one of the most complex translation quality programs in the world. So there's definitely uh, quite a bit of things that are maybe uh, challenging to grasp. Um, but let me show you, and maybe this will um, become a little bit more visual. So um, I do hope you can see my screen right now. So after all the automation uh, that Paula has been talking about that has actually been built by, by her team kicks in. So uh, new tasks for quality evaluation are uh, now created in Content Quo and the files that have been returned from the uh, translation supplier uh, actually get here automatically. So you can see you have a project here with uh, two source languages. Like I said, this is probably quite peculiar. If you've never worked on um, projects from the parliament, I haven't seen many other teams, to be honest, that have the same level of complexity. Um, so once we have the files here and have completed the, the counting of words, or rather of characters, because this is how uh, the parliament counts, uh, we proceed with automatic sampling. Um, so right now, um, we have automatically pre-selected uh, a sample of about 15% uh, from the overall size of this translation assignment. And like Paula was saying, uh, this actually have been uh, distributed pro rata uh, by Content Quo. Again, this, this process is fully automated to give the right proportion of coverage of the translations. But why is sampling generally needed? Because the volume of even outsourced translation is so huge that it's completely unrealistic to assess the quality of it in its entirety. So hence, sampling is used and we help to make it as efficient as as quick as possible. So this shows the outcome of this pro rata sampling uh, process that we just covered. The first file is much smaller, the second file is much bigger, and then the pro rata allocation has been done by Content Quo to meet the very uh, specific uh, sampling uh, recommendations from the Parliament's uh, quality unit. Um, so now we know exactly what the translator or the evaluator the parliament will be looking at from this particular translation. Uh, next bit is the workflow bit. Um, I want to emphasize here that the, the parliament has a very stringent way of assessing the quality uh, of translations. And at many points in time, there's actually more than one linguist involved into making the final judgment. So they strive really hard to make the assessment as objective and as precise as possible. Uh, so you can rest assured that your work has been scrutinized and evaluated in the most objective way possible. Again, this is quite unique. We work with many teams around the world and the parliament's approach is spectacular. So this is why the workflow in Quantum Quo has three steps instead of just one, because there's a um, certain process or a certain workflow, again, between different linguists that work together collaboratively on the Content Quo platform in order to produce the most objective, the most reliable judgment on how good or how bad the delivered translation has actually been, right? Um, so that's the part that still needs some human intervention. Again, it will probably be automated away in the future because Content Quo has capabilities for automatically balancing the workload and finding the best fit people as well. Um, so hopefully we'll get to that in the next year. And now, once we have everything set up, we are ready to start, okay? So the, the tr translation from the contractor is in the system fully automatically. It has been sampled. So we have about 15% of the volume. Again, this has been fully automatic. Um, the assistants um, from the Parliament's DG translation have assigned the right language to do the work and they will check the settings and they will kick off the quality evaluation. So now the workflow moves to the next step in Content Quo, and we send a notification message to one of the linguists working inside the Parliament's uh, language units 
and 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 she gets a notification in her mailbox and she can start working on this particular assignment logging into content well in her browser and this is what she would um see and this is what she would do um yes for anybody from the parliament team watching this this is not the production server so the configuration is slightly different but we're here for the a workflow demonstration after all aren't we um so once uh they have a sample of the translation and you can see this is a sample because the segment numbering starts from 60 here so we're looking uh, at a piece at the subset of this translation and not at its entirety and same for the second file so lots and lots of segments have been sampled out um for quantum quo in order to balance the workloads on the evaluators uh, working in the parliament language units so once this is said and done they can actually scan the translation for any kind of issues or quality mistakes or non-compliances to the requirements they flag them right here so they annotate the mistakes um directly in quantum quo according to the um really thought out um quality methodology that has been designed by the parliament's quality unit in consultation was uh with the language units themselves um so I i'm very sorry i don't speak any italian that's the the language i'm using today so i will pretend this is actually a mistranslation and if this is your your text on screen please don't fret about it this data is not going anywhere beyond this demo so your performance is completely safe now i will provide an explanation here again completely fake uh the meaning oops the meaning is the opposite of the source so i'll explain what the error is about and you can see that content quo automatically calculates this quality score again this is uh done according to the rules uh designed by the parliament's team and um they are they are thought out in a way to make the quality assessment as objective as humanly possible and to eliminate any kind of bias right so this is why the automatic scoring helps make more objective decisions it has been tried and tested on many occasions and it is um i think at the moment quite quite reliable and representative um so they might also annotate you know corrections here uh let's pretend i am correcting a mistake which is probably the opposite of truth and probably introducing mistakes now, but let's pretend I'm correcting uh, mistakes. Um, so that's another step of the workflow that's done by the evaluators in content quo. So if they spot a mistake, they will propose an improved or corrected translation right here in content quo. Uh, and that, that mistake uh, can then be used as the basis for uh, categorizing the error assigning a severity level to that and explaining what the mistake is all about so all of these are crucial pieces of input to getting an objective uh, quality score and evaluating the translation properly so that's basically what happens next in the workflow again i'll pretend this one is a terminology issue it's a mi minor one and once again uh we'll see how the score uh changes based on the amount of issues that have been reported during this evaluation stage um i will finish this as an evaluator so let's assume i have done my work in full and i have assessed the entire sample assigned to myself so now the rest of the automated workflow will continue the second linguist might get a chance to provide their input on the quality evaluation this is called the validation step um at the parliament and it's designed to again increase the objectivity of quality evaluation eliminate any kind of human bias that creeps in and uh, make sure that the judgments made on the performance of a given contractor is as um as grounded as as humanly possible right so this is where they uh, can talk to each other about this particular issue uh in the built-in chat facility which allows for secure and almost real-time communication between different team members um, in the in the parliament's CG translation. This is where they can accept issues they agree with or reject issues that uh, they believe have not been properly categorized, not properly annotated, so basically do not deserve to be reported to the uh, translator at all. Not a real issue. And once again, um, they will finish uh, this part of the process and once a full workflow in content quote is completed this 
results and this quality report, uh, which provides a lot of information and a lot of insights into the actual uh, quality levels of this particular translation assignment as it has been assessed by the, the Parliament's teams. And at which point a report is generated uh, by Content Quo also in an uh, offline friendly forum, such as an Excel file. And then um, it gets picked up by Paula's team automation and handled further by the, uh, by the rest of the Parliament's automated systems. Paula, back to you. See how this gets back. Let's see how this gets back to um, our workflow system. Um, you've seen the uh, report that uh, was generated in Content Co has a score and has an Excel table showing the um, results of the uh, evaluation. Well, in our uh, workflow tool, which is specifically designed for uh, DigiTrad, the um, translator only needs to click on the green button to retrieve the evaluation report. Once the uh, report is retrieved, he, he, see, he, she's, um, he or she sees a blue uh, button says finished and the score is 100% in this case. I, um, I took an example of a perfect translation that also happens from time to time and makes us very happy. And then as soon as these are retrieved, the score and the report are attached uh, automatically to a message that goes to our external translation unit. From there, uh, it is communicated to the external contractor who uh, obviously has the option to um, ask for more information or to um, or try to obtain a better score if, uh, if the case is. And also then once um, the um, process of further information is uh, completed, this score factors in into the payment because um, for uh, in order to ensure that the quality of our uh, translations stays high, we have high expectations from our contractors and we also have a penalty system for um, deliverers the levers that are not up to our standards. And with that, the circle is closed and the, uh, out, the contractors can be paid. It also counts, the, the evaluation also counts for uh, the dynamic ranking. We have for certain languages um, contracts that um, include several um, language services uh, providers and those are ranked dynamically based on the quality and the amount of work that they provide to us. And um, that ranking is calculated also based on these evaluations. So as, as you can see, these are really uh, an important element uh, in our relationship with, uh, with our freelance uh, contractors. And with this, we close the circle. Thank you very much for uh, your attention and let us know what else you want to know. So, okay, I'm questions. going to jump straight in there because uh, we've got lots of questions and we've basically got one minute. Um, so at least I wanted to get the top question, which has 17 votes, which is from Tilna. And it says, isn't it tricky for the translator to assess a segment without the immediate context? I would say yes, it is. Uh, one reason why uh, we also provide to our translator uh, who does the evaluation, the full translation. The fact that they have to evaluate only a sample, uh, it does not um, prevent them in any way to have the whole document available in source and target and in bilingual format also. Indeed. So the, in content quality, they can see the entire translation and they also have access to reference material. So I believe exact same ones that have been actually sent to the original uh, translation contractor. Exactly. Okay, good. Well, I'm afraid we can't do any more questions, but Paula and Kirill are, um, can be on the chat uh, if you want in uh, Umbrella in the platform. Uh, I apologize that we ran over, but I think it was good to get all the details there and to actually see how the system worked. Uh, so do uh, feel free to ask them questions on Umbrella. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank them and in fact, all our demonstrators this afternoon. It's been absolutely fascinating. There's now going to be a 20 minute coffee break uh, before the final panel discussion, looking at what's next in automation in the translation industry. 
And after that, we're going to have an out of the box uh, climax to this year's TEF. Uh, you're going to have to tune in to find out more. But now it's break time. I hope to see you back here at 20 past three Central European time. And that marks the close of this session.